Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. I'm your host, Chris Smith, here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. It's good to be with everybody again for another Wednesday edition of our lecture program, where we get to meet interesting people and learn interesting things. A lot of times, what's going on right here in our own backyards in and around North Carolina. So thanks for tuning in and thanks for joining us. This program is also brought to you as a partnership with the Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. They help organize and bring in the guest speakers. We host and broadcast the show here at the museum and working together now for several years, it's a great opportunity to bring you the latest and greatest news, education, science, nature, technology, all the great stuff that we love to learn about right here. Uh, well, right now, right here virtually to your screen. So if you're watching with us on YouTube, remember that you get to participate in our program every single week, every Wednesday at noon. Jump in the chat. If anything, just say hi. Maybe let us know where you're watching today's program from, what you're interested in regarding today's topic. And as we go through the presentation with our guest speaker, make sure that you're leaving your thoughts and your questions for our guest. At the end of the presentation, it's audience Q&A. So I'll be looking at the chat or the comments on Facebook in order to grab your thoughts and share them with our guest speakers. And uh, hopefully we can create you know, a really good dialogue and conversation around these topics that we have every single week. So make sure you jump in the chat and participate. Let me bring in today's guest. Let's get started. Let's roll with the show. Today's guest is Dr. Emily Yeager. Emily is an assistant professor in the Department of Recreation Sciences at East Carolina University, and I think is going to give us some interesting insights into what's happening in Eastern North Carolina. Emily, welcome to the show. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me today. And hi, everyone who's joining us. It's great to be here. Um, so are you ready for me to just share my screen now? I'm ready. I think okay. everybody watching is probably ready. So okay. great. let's learn something new. So... If someone were to ask you, uh, what is an asset in your community? Uh, you might say, well, I don't know. Is it, what do you mean? What is an asset, first of all? And who is that asset for? Um, and when we think about, you know, what is an asset in our community? Oftentimes we might even overlook things that others might consider assets in our community. But there is a process uh, when we think about sustainable community development for asset mapping that can help communities achieve the vision of what they want to be. And today I wanted to talk to you about an asset mapping project that's happening in eastern North Carolina, um, specifically in Nash, Edgecombe, Pitt, and Beaufort counties. And I'll tell you a little bit about that process and um, give you some background on the reason why this asset mapping is happening. So the first thing that I wanted to introduce the crowd to is uh, this idea of a blue economy. So um, if you pull up Google Maps and you take a look at where East Carolina University is, Greenville, North Carolina, and you look east, the main natural resource feature that you're going to see is water. There's water everywhere. There's streams, there's rivers, there's lakes, there's estuaries, there's sounds, and there's oceans. And uh, starting about, um, we'll say about 20 years ago, um, the United Nations uh, began thinking about how do we think about our waters as a resource that we can conserve, we can uh, utilize not only for, um, you know, extraction of natural resources, but as something for economic development that is sustainable for communities that live near bodies of water. And over the past 20 years, especially in the past 10 years here in the United States, we have seen federal agencies such as the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, 
Uh, they're the ones that are responsible for uh, many different types of products that you in, uh, consume, including weather forecast, as well as North Carolina Sea Grant, which is our uh, coastal and coastal conservation um, state agency here in North Carolina. Uh, they have gotten behind this idea of what we call a blue economy. And um, the idea is to promote conservation of waterways in order to, again, promote sustainable community development. And oftentimes when you hear about the blue economy from the perspective of these federal and state agencies, there's quite an emphasis on, uh, we'll just say saline water, so oceans and sounds. But uh, we know that in places like Michigan, for example, where the Great Lakes are, um, there is an opportunity even in freshwater environments to implement this idea of blue economy. So what might that look like uh, in a place like Greenville, North Carolina, um, maybe Raleigh, North Carolina, maybe in the mountains of North Carolina where you have freshwater environments? The idea is to connect the blue ways with the terrestrial or your land in a seamless way. So getting people to, out onto the waterways, using them, and also being able to uh, do that in such a way where they can come in uh, to communities and spend money, create positive economic impact, but also doing that in a sustainable way. So in Eastern North Carolina, specifically in the four counties where we are working on our project, um, there is quite a few assets, or you could think of also resources as another way to think of assets. Um, there are quite a few resources that improve the quality of life of residents in the communities that live in these counties, but also are tourism attractions for visitors. Uh, right now, however, uh, there isn't really a regional way to promote all of these assets in one place. Each one of these uh, counties and the communities that exist within them um, do great jobs in promoting all of the great assets that they have in their communities. But we're really interested in then helping them do that also uh, at a regional level um, with a tool perhaps that could help others know about what these assets are in the community to attract visitors and also make the residents more aware of what's in their backyard. So uh, again, the counties that we are looking at are Nash County, Edgecombe County, Pitt County, and Beaufort County. So uh, Chris, I have a question for the audience. Um, I would like to know what people think, or how would you define a river corridor? So um, we'll give some time for uh, folks to answer that in the chat. And then maybe when you start seeing responses, uh, you can let me know what people are saying. I can do that. Although, uh, like, what is a river? I don't know. Is this like a philosophical question? It could be. Um, let's think about it physically. So what okay, do you physically. think a river corridor is? Right. So, I mean, I've got what I think a river corridor is. Sure. I'd love to hear. And uh, when I think of a river corridor, I think of you've got the body of water. So you've got the river channel and then you've got the banks. Uh which at least the rivers I'm familiar with are generally treed. Like there's, there's forest. Um, but then how much further off of the bank is a river constitutes river corridor? I don't, I don't know. I'm not too certain. So do we have any guesses from the audience? Let's see. We've got possibly the river and surrounding connected terrestrial ecosystems. Okay. Uh, Stephen is guessing floodplain could define river corridors. So all of your definitions would be correct. So uh, Chris, to your point, 
we could get very philosophical about this. And depending on the lens or the perspective that you're coming from, um, when you think about what river corridors are, you might in fact be thinking from an ecosystem perspective, like terrestrial ecosystems that are connected to your waterways. Um, someone who mentioned floodplains, that's a totally different way to be thinking about river corridors, but it's definitely accurate depending on the type of work that you're doing. For our work with promoting, um, in this case, a blue way for economic development in eastern North Carolina, uh, we are generally just thinking about the waterway, which in this case, now I'll introduce what the waterway is, are the Tar and Pamlico Rivers, which intersect, uh, they intersect those four counties, Nash, uh, Edgecombe, Pitt, and Beaufort. And then we're thinking about the land that's tied to them uh, in the county itself. So that's a very broad geographic region, but within those counties, uh, there are so many assets and resources that uh, would draw visitors to that county, but also might, as they're visiting, they might include activities on the either the Tar or the Pamlico rivers uh, when they come to visit. So for a visual perspective, um, on your left-hand side, you can see a map that has the corridor drawn in purple. And this line, uh, it follows the trail of the Tar and Pamlico River or the way that it cuts through our coastal plain. And so this is the area east of I-95 um, that the Tar Pamlico rivers run through, which constitute the eastern portion of the Tar Pamlico River Basin, uh, that we are interested in mapping assets for. So those four counties with these waterways, we want to know uh, what types of activities would people come to these counties to do, and what do residents in the communities in these counties uh, do to interact with the waterways and any other assets in the communities. And I really like this quote here uh, about the voyage of discovery is not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And I think this is a particularly relevant quote for this project um, in eastern North Carolina and particularly here in the Tar Pamlico River Basin. We are so rich in many different types of resources, whether that's sociocultural heritage, whether that is nature based tourism assets, hospitality assets. Um, but depending on your perspective, you may only see one type of asset in your community. And our goal is to have a holistic perspective on thinking about what all of these assets might be. So for those of you that are interested in learning a little bit more and kind of seeing some visuals of assets that um, have already been identified in the corridor, uh, you can scan this QR code here and it'll take you straight to an RGIS story map, which is uh, one of my new favorite visualization tools, but it basically just kind of tells you a story so far of the types of resources that have been identified. Um, this particular project was developed by uh, one of my classes in fall 2020, which I was so proud of because they did this completely virtually. But we're going to continue to build out this story um, in this story map software as we continue to collect assets. Um, so if you would like to follow along on that story map, you are more than welcome to. And at the very top of that story map page, there's actually a purple button that allows you to subscribe to updates about this project. And uh, I will encourage you to do that again in just a little bit um, and you'll see why. So uh, we are calling this a blue economy corridor. So again, think back to what a river corridor is. So of course we had many different definitions from the audience and from Chris. Um, and so just think about the corridor again as the waterway connected to the land uh, that it directly touches in these four counties. And so I'm just using BEC as a shortened way to say blue economy corridor. And we are looking at a variety of resources that the communities might have. So nature-based tourism resources, hospitality resources, sociocultural heritage resources, 
public health resources, conservation resources, and probably of most interest to this audience would be the STEM assets that also exist within our corridor. So examples of nature-based tourism assets that might exist uh, could be um, kayak launches, could be fishing spots, it could be wildlife viewing. And uh, in addition, as we are thinking about these assets, we also are thinking about accessibility all throughout. So uh, for example, our partner for this project is Sound Rivers, which is um, our conservation nonprofit for the Tar Pamlico River Basin. Uh, they also manage other river basins, but uh, they're partnering on this project and they have um, helped install ADA, uh, kayak, uh, ADA accessible kayak launches um, on the Tar and Pamlico rivers. So uh, that was just an example to show you that as we're thinking about these assets, we are thinking about accessibility uh, for each one of them, each category of assets. Hospitality assets could include um, dining, could be lodging, could be information centers. Uh, you know, in our particular corridor, there is a, an abundance of microbreweries, uh, which have uh, been really amazing to see develop because they've been developed right uh, in you know, revitalized building structures that are right on waterways. For example, I think about like Rocky Mountain Mills um, and what's happening in Washington, North Carolina, uh, which, you know, both of those communities um, reside within our corridor. I also think about uh, sociocultural heritage assets. So this could include, for example, in our corridor, uh, the African-American um, music trail uh, intersects this part of the corridor. Uh, perhaps it's theater and arts. Um, perhaps it is about um, diversity, uh, you know, initiatives that encourage diversity in our um, population and communities in Eastern North Carolina, in this corridor particularly, and perhaps ones that would attract diverse groups of people to visit uh, our counties in the corridor. Uh, public health assets are also of interest for us to document for this project. So that could include greenways, parks, um, I think about, for example, the initiative that uh, NCDNR has with NC Paths, so promoting physical activity while being in the outdoors. Uh, that is actually one of the reasons why we began thinking about public health assets to include um, on our final map of the corridor. Uh, also, we're interested in including conservation assets on this map. So, uh, for example, Sound Rivers, the uh, conservation nonprofit that I mentioned earlier, they uh, do swim guides each summer for the waterways that they manage. So they'll do water quality samples and then publish the guides to tell people whether or not it's safe to recreate in the waterways. Uh, they also have like a litter reporting system. So these are all examples of um, assets that we would want to cross promote on this uh, final map. And as I mentioned, probably of most interest to this audience would be uh, the STEM assets that are available. So, um, you know, we think about like the planetarium that's now here at Contanea Creek in Pitt County. Uh, we think about, um, you know, just wildlife education, anything that will help educate people of all ages and across all backgrounds about the natural environment that, uh, and, and the um, biodiversity that we are so rich in, in this part of the state, uh, we are really interested in documenting and having as a part of this map. And we know um, that actually there is already quite a bit of STEM asset mapping that's happening across, a, across North Carolina, um, in, particular, in particular in the Western part of the state. Uh, they've already begun developing their own asset map of STEM um, resources. And there's even interest in possibly developing a STEM trail at some point. So our map is not trying to reinvent the wheel. We just want to cross promote what's already happening at a very hyper local level. 
So uh, I keep alluding to this idea about a map, a map. So I've shown you uh, a picture of the corridor on a map. Um, but the final product for this project is going to be a digital interactive map uh, where you can add assets to that map, you can add pictures, you can provide a description of what these assets are. And there's two ways that you can participate in adding assets to this map. And I will say that you don't have to be a resident in the four counties of the corridor to contribute to this map. We are interested in hearing what visitors have to say. As a North Carolina resident, what do you think would be included on this map? Um, and perhaps even if you're not in North Carolina, if you're outside of the state, but you have visited this part of Eastern North Carolina, we would love to uh, hear about your contributions and see what you would add to this map. So uh, I have another QR code for you. And uh, this is the first way that people can participate in this project. So uh, this survey uh, doesn't take very long um, and it is available in both English and Spanish, depending on what your web browser settings are set to. And so uh, this survey asks about a few things um, beyond just what asset you might add to um, our map. So we are interested in a few things. One would be what type of access uh, do you, if you are a resident in this corridor, what type of access do you typically have to the waterways or historically what type of access have you had? What type of recreational activities have you done on the waterways? How do you perceive your environment? Do you feel connected to it? Um, and all of that sort of relates back to um, access. And we want to know as well, um, you know, what are things that might either uh, prevent or encourage you to support continued development for this corridor? Um, right now for this project, we have quite a few stakeholders who are already involved in trying to help uh, with this asset mapping. And uh, while we have the stakeholder support, we definitely want to make sure that this is something that uh, residents within the communities at the corridor intersects and that, you know, in general, people would feel like is, an, is a contribution and something that would help promote sustainable community development. Um, in these four counties. So um, I'm gonna give the audience just a second if you want to scan uh, this QR code. And Chris, if anybody has questions in the chat, please let me know. Um, I'm just gonna give folks just a second. And folks, I'm also dropping these links in the chat. So if you can't get the scan to work, you can click on them right over there in the comments. And at the end of the survey, um, there is an opportunity, there's an interactive map where you can um, add your points. And like I mentioned earlier, you can add any type of metadata that you would like. So pictures, description, um, and you can add multiple points to the map if you would like. And uh, a few things that we've been thinking about with this survey, um, you know, as, as we've been figuring out, you know, what are the ethics behind asset mapping? We definitely want to make sure that if there's something that a local community doesn't want promoted, we'll make sure that we're cognizant of that as well, because uh, one of the things that we kind of wrestle with in uh, sustainable tourism development is making sure that uh, both the residents and the residents are happy with what's being marketed and promoted in a community and, uh, and that visitors feel like they're having an authentic experience. So the second way that you can participate in this project is through in-person workshops. So these um, are going to be occurring in spring 2022. And I'm very excited to say that they are supported by Hometown Strong. 
And Hometown Strong partners with uh, a variety of state agencies in North Carolina uh, to basically promote sustainable community development. Um, and that can look like a lot of different things um, and a lot of initiatives can help achieve sustainable community development. And so they are supportive um, of our face-to-face -face workshops. And so the way that those will uh, look is we will um, have workshops at places, uh, at least two workshops in each county at places that are accessible to the general public. And uh, those workshops will be basically like if you're taking the survey, but you'll have it in person. And so uh, we'll have a large map printed and posted at the front of the room. And uh, we'll be able to facilitate conversations about the types of questions that we ask in the survey and then give people an opportunity to come up to the map and be able to pin assets there and tell us about what they think those assets are, why are they important? Um, and again, um, some other things that I would like to add when you think about asset mapping, um, you know, we want, we want folks to feel empowered in uh, how this process happens. And so uh, we'll be thinking about offering the workshops um, at different times of day. So for example, if we were going to do two workshops in Nash County, we would be thinking about hosting them um, maybe one in the afternoon or morning and then one in the evening, for example, because we know that people work all kinds of hours and all kinds of jobs. So we would want people to uh, feel like they could access these workshops. And um, let's see. So we also... Um, we also are going to be hosting the workshops in Spanish and in English. And um, a few other things about the workshops is um, we are hoping that we will be able to host more, um, you know, depending on, you know, how well our workshops go with round with this first round in the spring. So related back to the survey, um, we are going to um, be sending out postcards uh, to zip codes that touch the waterway. And um, that postcard is going to have a link to the QR code where people can take the survey. And I see a note from Chris that perhaps the survey link didn't work. So I am going to check on, I'm going to double check on that, um, perhaps after we get done with this talk to figure out uh, maybe troubleshooting why um, that link didn't pop up for folks. And I apologize about that, um, but we'll get that figured out. So basically in spring 2022, we'll have both the in-person workshops and uh, the survey open for people to contribute uh, their assets to the corridor. So I would love um, to continue uh, this conversation with us about, you know, anything that ranging from the philosophical question of what's a river corridor to, uh, you know, talking to us about, you know, what are the assets that you would like to see on this map? And if you are interested, um, the first link that Chris uh, dropped in the chat and that I also uh, kind of provided a QR code for that story map page, the very top of that purple button, you can subscribe for project updates. And uh, we'll be able to, um, we won't spam you, I promise, but we'll let you know about when those face-to-face -face workshops are happening, where they're happening, um, and how you can participate. And of course, the survey will continue to remain open. Um, so I'll, you can also scan this QR code here to directly sign up with just your email. So again, I promise we won't spam you, but we would love to keep you updated on the progress of this project. And so with that, um, I want to just thank some collaborators that have been working diligently on this project. And um, 
I've had quite a great student team uh, that has been working with me at ECU to continue updating our story map and all of our other uh, sort of outputs from this project. And um, I would love to answer questions from the audience and uh, you know any questions that y'all might have. And I am going to check on that survey link to see if we can um, figure out, maybe troubleshoot what the issue might have been. So I'm going to leave my email up here, um, but but Chris, that pretty much wraps up my presentation, and um, I'm going to kind of see if I can troubleshoot what happens with our story uh, with our um, survey link. All right, no problem. Uh, everybody, wherever you're at, let's give a great big virtual round of applause to Dr. Yeager for sharing uh, what's happening out in the eastern part of the state. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, part of the problem may have been that I put the wrong link in the chat. And so uh, some of the users are, are troubleshooting it for me. Uh, but when I scanned the QR code too, I was getting um, a, a dead end. Okay. So folks, let me know in the chat if it's working for you. Let me know how you got it to work because we want to share this resource uh, with everybody and, uh, and get everybody's input and, and get the conversation going. So as uh, I'm waiting for questions to populate here as people get their thoughts out onto our virtual paper here, um, Emily, what, what kind of brought you to this project of making like a digital map of all of these assets and who do you anticipate will use something like this the most? That's a really great question. Um, so I, I would like to share with the audience where I'm from and, and why I'm connected to this uh, riverway. So I'm from Franklin County, North Carolina, which is north of Raleigh, and I'm about 30 minutes from the Virginia line in Epsom, North Carolina. And so I grew up playing on the Tar River like my whole life. And then when I came to ECU for my undergrad and master's education, I um, still continue to recreate on the Tar River and, and still kind of took it for granted. And then when I came back to ECU in 2018, I noticed that so many communities um, in the eastern portion of the Tar Pamlico River Basin were doing some really great things uh, to promote their community and the waterway that, that was uh, running through it. And so I began to think about, okay, how could we, you know, continue to elevate the promotion that they're doing, but more in a regional way. And so one way that we thought that we could do this was through a digital interactive map, um, because one, it would allow people to collaborate. It'll, it's almost like citizen science, right? So people can contribute what they think uh, would be special and important to promote in the community. And um, also, you know, digital maps are pretty much a norm now when we look at uh, from a geographic perspective, uh, how we interpret places and spaces. And so um, the type of people that would use this resource, uh, so anybody that falls within those six categories of assets could use this as a tool, um, perhaps from a tourism perspective, you might use it for marketing and promotion or basically an inventory of knowing what's in the region or what's around you to market and promote. Um, if you are, for example, a STEM educator, you might want to know, well, what, what types of STEM assets exist here that maybe, um, you know, we could design field trips or we can provide this as another resource uh, for our students. Um, and if you are, for example, a conservation um, professional, you might be thinking about reaching out to us to uh, promote some of the um, tools and the and the digital tools that you're using to promote conservation in your region. So uh, it can be used by a variety of stakeholders, um, really anybody who fits within those categories. Excellent. Thank you. Lisa has a question. Do you think the project will increase the community's knowledge of the cultural or natural history of the area? Have public libraries shown interest in the project? That is a really great question. So another goal of this project is to increase uh, residents' awareness of 
these uh, resources that exist in your own backyard. Um, again, I talked about earlier in the presentation how our perspective and our lens in life in of our own community uh, sometimes you know might miss what what's what's sitting right in your backyard to be discovered. And uh, we have really been trying to be creative in thinking about all of the stakeholders that we might need to engage uh, and, and be interested in being a part of this map. And we have uh, public libraries would be an excellent asset to add. Um, they could fall under perhaps the sociocultural um, assets for sure, maybe STEM assets. Um, you know, and that's the interesting thing about asset mapping is that sometimes things can fit under multiple categories. So there's no hard and fast rules about that. But uh, I think that anything that contributes to the resident's quality of life and uh, is the number one uh, metric to use to decide whether or not something would be an asset to go on the map. So public libraries would certainly uh, be something worth adding. Um, and then of course, I definitely think when we think about who comes and visits communities, um, it's great to know if you're traveling with kids, what are all the things that we can do while we're traveling? Um, because I have a child myself, I know that we think about those things uh, as we uh, endeavor on our recreation pursuits. This might be a tricky question, but what do you think about the difference between the, the resource that you're creating here, you know, this, this local or localized map uh, of these great assets uh, and that you hope would, would become like a very robust resource for people looking at these, like looking for something to do or looking at a particular resource to take advantage of compared to something like, I don't like the attractions button on, you know, your Google maps. Yeah, I think that that's a really great question. And I'm sure a lot of people would ask that is, you know, how is this different? Um, and one of the things is uh, thinking about that this is participatory. So yes, in Google Maps, people can add uh, their own data points or, or, you know, they can contribute to the metadata of a location on a map and they could provide pictures, et cetera. But there isn't really that much guidance as to, uh, first of all, like what you might want to contribute to the map. And, um, you know, that's one thing that we really are trying to promote here is that community members can uh, feel empowered um, and feel pride because there are because through this corridor, people are wanting to come to the community and there are things that are worth mapping. Um, and we could have certainly done this uh, via Google Maps. We thought about that, uh, possibly doing uh, the mapping software just being open source Google Maps. But um, by using software such as uh, what we're using through um, Esri, which is the company that provides uh, all the different products that we're using, we can do some pretty cool visualization of like survey data and uh, the all the other information like descriptions and pictures that people provide. Um, so, you know, I would say that it's probably the strength of using this is more about that emphasis on community input and that guidance that we're providing to kind of remind people that there's a diversity of things that you might want to uh, map and and for you to know about and for others to know about in your community. See, I love that. Like knowing that the information is coming from, even broadly speaking, people who are in my community. I mean, I'm not in the Tar Pamlico River Basin, but you know, I would know if I looked there that, you know, the the things that I'm looking at were largely populated by by that community, you know, like, so what's, what's going to be a great thing to go see or do or experience? Uh, they know more so maybe than, you know, people who drove through it in a day and dropped a pin on a Google map. I like that. Uh, let's see. There's another question here too. Will wants to know, how would you phrase the elevator pitch for your work? And I guess a great follow-up would be like, how are you getting the word out there? That's a great question. Um, I appreciate I appreciate you asking that. So the elevator pitch, or I guess the reason why this work is important, um, is that 
in Eastern North Carolina, there is a need to uh, think about many different opportunities for economic development that can provide jobs and prevent uh, people from leaving to go to other places and search for employment and livelihoods, that there are opportunities here and reasons to stay to have a great quality of life. And so uh, that's one of the big drivers for doing this work. And um, Chris, can you ask me your follow up question again? Oh, well, so so it was, uh, what's the elevator pitch for it? And then um, how do you get the word out about it? Where do you put your elevator pitch in order to get people to participate and buy into your project? Right. That's a great question, too. So I was hoping the survey link was going to work today uh, by, you know, promoting our work in outlets such as NTEE's uh, lunchtime series, which I promise after this talk, I will figure out what's happening and we can hopefully share that link out with people um, uh, in maybe in the recording or something like that. But um, so definitely trying to talk about this work in as many outlets as possible that relate to the diversity of assets. But then another thing, uh, so when in the spring, when we start sending out um, the postcards with survey links on them, uh, the postcards will be going to zip codes, every house in a zip code that touches the Tar or Pamlico River. So if you live in one of those zip codes, you will be getting a postcard in your mailbox about this, um, about this project and your opportunity to participate, whether that's via the survey or if you would like to attend a face-to-face -face workshop. So um, another thing that I've been doing is really diversifying our uh, who our advisory board is. We have an advisory board for the corridor, uh, and they consist of people who range from economic development directors in these counties to um, even our STEM educators that, that are, um, you know, leaders in these counties and in Eastern North Carolina. So uh, thinking about a diverse group that might have interest in this map is another way to, um, I think, promote this work. Excellent, thank you. All right, the next question that I've got here have you looked at the role or potential of political or community entrepreneurship in leveraging assets? In other words, how to connect with individuals or organizations to leverage the assets? Can you ask that one more time? Sorry. Yeah. Marty uh, posted this question. Have you looked at the role or potential of political or community entrepreneurship in leveraging assets? In other words, how to connect individuals or organizations to leverage the assets. Yes, so um, absolutely. And, and Marty, I, let me know if I'm not answering your question um, thoroughly, but thinking about um, entrepreneurship and more of that local level promotion of the assets, um, one of the things that we definitely want to do is to try to perhaps in the future have another uh, filter, if you will, on our map, which would, you know, in addition to the six that we already have, uh, provide sort of a hub that would be um, basically you know, links to all of the Chamber of Commerce's, for example, in the communities uh, that that uh, run through the corridor so that people could see who those, uh, local businesses are, and so that those people can also cross promote the map in their own work, whether that is having a QR code in their business, or whether that means uh, to this to our map, or whether that means, um, you know, they're just sort of, they can take ideas from the assets that people have put on there, and they could create their own marketing and promotion materials of their community. So, one of the things we would love to inspire is again that pride and the pride in the community, and then perhaps their own individual uh, marketing and, and conveyance of what their community is all about. Generating that sense of place uh, at that very local level is very, very important. Excellent stuff. I'll wait, I'll let you know if Marty has any more to add to, his, to that question. Um, but I also really appreciate the focus and emphasis that you placed on uh, accessibility, and diversity and inclusion efforts as part of this too. So that, you know, 
really anyone, I guess, at least with an internet connection should be able to, to take advantage of it and find assets, resources, uh, you know, things in, in their communities or, or if they plan on visiting from the outside, things that, you know, they can in fact participate in, I guess you would say participate in the blue economy in, in these places up and down the Tar Pamlico. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because that goes back to uh, someone's question about the elevator speech and then your follow-up question about differentiating this from like, you know, Google Maps attractions, for example. So the fact that we are offering this uh, survey in both English and Spanish is really important because we want to feel, we want people to feel like they're included and they can participate in their way that makes sense to them. And then, uh, because accessibility and inclusion looks like a lot of different things, whether that's physical, mental, social, emotional inclusion. And so also from the accessibility piece, um, you know, there's not many resources out there, for example, that can try to, um, you know, say, okay, here is an ADA accessible, uh, you know, kayak launch, or here is um, something, here are resources for those that, that are hearing impaired, for example, um, and you can kind of, and so as people are putting their assets onto these maps, they can self-designate that, which is really awesome. And we don't, we don't really have a hub for that type of information right now, um, really in many different, really anywhere. Um, you can find it in bits and pieces scattered around the web, but it's not in one centralized place and it's not included with mainstream marketing of uh, a community in the sense of place that's there. Yeah, excellent. I mean, I think that's a that makes it such a great resource for so many different communities across North Carolina. Uh, let's see another question that we've got. Oh, Marty says thumbs up. That's exactly what what he was thinking. Uh, and Will writes again. Many of those in Eastern North Carolina don't have access to the internet. How would you propose including them in the conversation? That is a great question. And I'm so glad that someone asked that. So that is one of the goals of the face-to-face -face workshops. So our idea is that in those in-person workshops, it would essentially be the same exact questions that we would ask in the survey and the same opportunity to add to a map that you could have online. So um, we have the opportunity uh, you know, through some of the work that I do, if you come up to the front of a room, which I just dropped a link to a new updated survey, by the way, Chris, I was going back and forth with our IT person here. So let's see if this survey works. Um, so if you put a pin on, uh, let's say, principal, okay, in, in uh, Edgecombe County, on the physical map, I can go in on the on my back end and I can insert that um, into my mapping software and it generates a latitude and longitude point that is basically the language that all of our mapping software reads. And I can just add that to the map for you. So that's an opportunity for people who do not have internet, but want to um, contribute to this. Uh, you can definitely attend those face-to-face in-person workshops. And when we begin advertising about those workshops, you know, I know I did talk about possibly subscribing uh, to, to uh, be emailed updates about the project. But again, if people don't have internet, that doesn't, you know, make any sense. So we'll be posting flyers um, at, you know, various public community points that make sense to a given community, whether that's your community center, your rec center, uh, maybe that's your, um, maybe your, um, sorry, I'm thinking about like maybe your post office, for example. So we'll be thinking about what those hubs are in communities for us to post flyers. And uh, we are currently making connections with um, what we call gatekeepers in communities, people who have access to, um, you know, they're basically the people you have to go through to earn access to all the other people in a community. And I think we all know, uh, if you think about your own experiences in your community, probably who gatekeepers might be in your community. Maybe you are a gatekeeper. And if you are, and you're in one of these four counties, I would love to talk to you. All right. Looks like the new link is working. Excellent. 
It's perfect. Thanks to your right. thanks to your technician behind the scenes. Yeah, he's awesome. All right. Well, Emily, thanks so much for being on the program today and for sharing with us the work that you're doing, this this new mapping resource that people can participate in and take advantage of uh, and giving us an idea of what's out there. Yeah, you're so welcome. And, and you know, that really is uh, another main goal of this project is I, I love our state. We have we have an amazing state and I am particularly biased and fond of Eastern North Carolina. And, um, you know, this whole process is something that we would love for other destinations or other places in North Carolina to replicate. Um, the idea of, you know, of a blue economy and leveraging your blue ways for sustainable community development uh, and doing this through our various types of asset mapping that we're doing is something that other communities can certainly replicate. Um, I am happy to chat with people if that's something that is of interest. And, um, you know, I, I'm here to be a resource for others uh, across the state. Excellent stuff. Thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in to another edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Of course, we'll be back here next Wednesday at noon with another great program for you. If I've got my calendar straight, next week is going to be a very special program. We'll have a panel discussion. It's the Hispanic and Latinx Leaders in STEM panel discussion. Don't miss out. Uh, Governor Cooper declared September 15th, uh, I think October 16th, maybe even later, as Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month. So we've got a special program for you. Don't miss out to hear from the leaders that we're bringing together together. That's next Wednesday at noon. Of course, you can subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel and click the bell next to that to get notified, and that will bring you right to us when we go live with the next program. You can also follow the Office of Environmental Education on Twitter, at North Carolina EE is their handle, and if you go to their website, eenorthcarolina.org, you can sign up for the newsletter in order to be notified every month when the programs are coming out and get a reminder email with the link to click to come and join us every single week. Great resources there for everybody to take advantage of. And I hope we'll see you all again here real soon at another edition of the lecture series. Take care, stay safe, keep your community safe. And we'll see you again next time. Bye everybody.